doing? Well, my name is Bruno. Uh, I work for a small company in Seattle. I live in San Francisco. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I was telling my peers I might be from America, but I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to make sure that uh, there's no fake news here today. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. I've been working with Jumia here for a bit, and uh, I'm really impressed with this company, Jumia. Their engineers are top notch. I, I meet a lot of engineers in my role, and this has been a real pleasure to be here. I learn from them oftentimes. I'm hoping here I can impart some knowledge to you um, in the next uh, 35 minutes. It's going to be mostly hands-on. If I go fast, that's intentional because there's a YouTube video recording of this and a hands-on walkthrough that I wrote. So you don't need to take notes because everything's documented in video and uh, written. So we ought to be in good shape. This talk is about the future, I think. Um, if you look across the, uh, the landscape at how people are running large distributed workloads, you're going to find that there is this notion of a containerized ecosystem out there. I assume all of you have heard of Docker and what a container is. Are we good with that? What is a, what is a container? It's simply a file system that encapsulates your application such that your application has all its dependencies bundled in the container, meaning that if it works on my laptop, it's going to work the exact same way in dev, in test, and in production. And so I work closely with Docker. They're based in my neighborhood there in San Francisco. It's really like probably the biggest kind of land shift, land grab in IT of the last 10, 10 years. It's, it's, it's a rather amazing phenomenon. Has anyone been to DockerCon by chance here in this room? It's an amazing event. I've never seen so many IT pros and developers be in one place at the same time and really be seeing things the same way. You know, historically IT pros and developers have been at odds, but the notion of DevOps and containerization is really changing the IT landscape. So I've been um, at Microsoft a little bit. Um, I focus on helping companies kind of get started. I have links to engineering teams. And so my job is really to dive as deep technically as I can. I'm often outside of my comfort zone. You know, in this profession, you never really get there. There's, it's always a journey. There's always more mountain to climb. So I'm humbled all the time by, uh, by my job. Um, so what are we going to do today? That's, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to just get right down to it. Uh, we're going to build out, I'm going to assume that someone's already provisioned the cluster. In this case, the cluster is running on Azure. But the way this cluster runs on Azure is the exact same way it would run anywhere else. So there's no vendor lock-in. This is a cloud agnostic solution. This can even be run on premises. So I've already installed the raw VMs. There's one master VM and two agent nodes, so three VMs. Obviously, in a, in a production scenario, you're looking at a 50 VM solution, 100, 200, depending on what you're trying to do. Now, when you think about um, Kubernetes in particular, um, Microsoft is very committed to this. We've hired Brendan Burns. Anybody know who Brendan Burns is? He's one of the co-creators of Kubernetes. Um, we just acquired a company called Deus, and that company is also very prominent in this ecosystem. So now they're working hand in hand, um, Gabriel Monroy and Brendan Burns, very committed to this platform. This is, I think, looking forward, something all of us in this room need to keep an eye on. There are three orchestrators. There's Kubernetes, anyone know another one? Docker Swarm, and DCOS, formerly known as Mesos. So what we want to do today is run this simple application. It's essentially a RESTful service backed up by MySQL. It's going to have Redis as the caching layer, potentially saving round trips to the database, right? If you cache the data, you don't need to keep going to the database. So it's a performance enhancing um, architecture. Um, we're going to use Flask. Anyone familiar with Flask? It's a Python framework for creating web apps. It's a simple one. Um, so the pod is essentially a container of containers. It, it holds, in this case, two containers. One of the containers is running Redis, the cache software, caching software. And the other container is running Flask, 
with Python. This is the actual container running the web app. Think of this as a microservice component. This is the front end. This is the IP address that lets us talk to the pod. It's the abstraction. It's the service to the running pod. Likewise, we have a running abstraction for MySQL and the service. So we're going to look at four files to create this. And there are YAML files. Are you familiar with YAML, YML? It's a kind of a declarative format. And there'll be four of them. One for this pod, one for that pod, and then two more for the services. And we're going to do all of this in the command line. And we're going to do fairly efficiently um, this, this provisioning. Also realize that when you set up a Kubernetes cluster, there are a number of pieces that I'm not going to dive into here that actually help the master node communicate with the agent nodes. Right? Because as a, the end user typically routes through this controller, there are many alternatives to this architecture with load balancers potentially here and other proxies that kind of uh, could alter this slightly. But in general, we always talk about a master node and agents or slave nodes. And that's true for Docker Swarm, Docker data centers, Mesos, DCOS, all of them operate on this principle of one or more <laughs> master nodes and one or more agent nodes. And every cluster will have that. So without further ado, I think I'm just going to dive in. I'm going to bounce back to this diagram as we do this. And you'll be able to see me build this out one piece at a time. We're also going to build our own custom Docker container. So we're going to build our own container here and store that container here on hub.docker.com. And now that means any of you in this room can use my container. This is already a pre-built container that lives on hub.docker.com. And Redis is a pre-built container that's available here. So it really dramatically reduces my ability to stand up this infrastructure. All these are images stored here. And when you run an image, that makes it a container. That's the difference between an image and a container. An image is just kind of a disk file artifact. And a container is that image running somewhere, in, in our case, in a pod. These very same um, images can run as containers in a Docker Swarm, a DCOS cluster, and a number of other environments. These are, those are just the top three. And if I had more time, I would talk about the disadvantages and differences among them. But it looks like Kubernetes is doing really well. Why? Why do you think it's doing well? It's the only one that's not really directly from a company. I mean, it initially came out of the work at Google, but it's truly an open source orchestrator as opposed to Docker, who's going to more a proprietary model. Same thing with Mesosphere's DCOS. They have their own versions. But this is truly an open source project, and Microsoft embraces um, this particular project. So let's go ahead by beginning by um, deploying our uh, code here. So I'm going to simply go here and have my friend type for me. We're going to go and create a directory here. And we're going to deploy all the artifacts we'll need to build out this cluster. And it's just a GitHub repo, as you can see. So it's going to go in here and download all the uh, necessary assets. And again, you'll be able to repeat this yourself. I'm going to go into um, the root folder here and show you the different pieces here with my tree command. So we're going to have a build. Um, folder here at the top, a deploy and a run. So we're just going to go through all of these files here, most of them, and describe how they fit together and how we, you would use them to deploy this uh, workload. So let's get going here. Let's start by um, taking a look at the build folder. So I'm going to clear this out and go to the build folder real quick and talk to you about building out our own custom container, our own image, and then putting it up. Where did I say we would put it? hub.docker.com. So these are the files that make up this container that we're going to build. This container contains Flask and Python. It's our web service. Let's go ahead and take a look at the main Python script that represents this web app. A couple notable things here. Um, let me put some line numbers here. Notice here on line number uh, 20, that is the init. That means if you give a URL, forward slash init, it's going to call this method. And what does this method do, it looks like? Let me uh, put this towards the top. It's going to basically build our database. It's 
going to drop the table up at the table that exists and rebuild the database. And it'll display the message, initialization done. If I call the URL of our cluster and say courses add, and I post some uh, data, some JSON data to it, it's going to do what, essentially? Do an insert to the database. If I pass in, say, a course number after the URL courses forward slash, it's going to do what? This is kind of interesting. It's going to do a select, potentially, but first it's going to do what? It's going to check the Redis cache to see if that data exists. If it does exist, it'll just return it from the cache. So otherwise it's record not found. So notice that it'll put the data in the cache if it doesn't exist. That way when it gets called a second time, it'll be there in the cache. So that's the web app. It's a simple Flask Python script to do that. Let's look at a couple other files. When I build my container, there will be dependencies I want to include, and that's just a list. It's the requirements file. Finally, um, let me uh, quit this file real quick and go to my next step here. Let's look at the Docker file. Anyone, anyone know what a Docker file is? All right, so many of you have seen this. It's simply a blueprint about the image we want to build. It's a very simple, extremely simple. It's basically saying, go to hub.docker.com, get the Python image, which is already built for us, and then we're going to simply expose port 5000, which is what Flask listens on for web requests, and then go ahead and run my app.py file, that file we just saw. So this container, when it fires up, it's simply going to run our web app. Python's already in that image, so there's nothing else to install. So in three lines, I can run my Flask application. But this is a blueprint. We have not built the image yet. How do we build this image? We do that with a docker build command. And this is that command. Let me uh, increase the font a little. So we're going to say docker build period, which means go to my current folder, look for the docker file, and call the image my repository name, Bruno Turkley, PyRedis, which is Python Redis. So the name of my image that I'm creating is PyRed. And then push it up to hub.docker.com, make it available to the rest of the world. So we're just going to execute this script ourselves here. I'm just going to go in here and just say bash build fat, just made a little shell script to make it easier. So it's building it right now on my kind of VM. I'm basically connected up to a Linux VM in Azure that I'm doing all this work. It's not part of my cluster, it's separate. So it did that, it pushed it up there. If I say Docker images, you'll see the image has just gotten created there. There it is. It's here locally, but where else is it as well? So if I go to Chrome, and I go to that URL where I just uploaded it, hub.docker.com, you'll see it a little more clearly in a second. If I go up to hub.docker.com, go to my tags, you'll see a few seconds ago I added the latest image. Now you should probably put version, well the resolution's not too good here, the contrast is missing, but um, you should get version numbers in general and do a latest. You should never do just latest, because you want to be able to lock down to specific version numbers. So now, everything I need to run in the cluster is up in hub.docker.com. The custom image I just built, what are the other two? Please, one at a time. Redis and MySQL, right? Three images are up on hub.docker.com right now. And I now need to deploy those to my cluster. So let's get into that. So the next step we're going to do over here is go over here to the um, uh, deploy folder to take a look at how we would deploy. Here are my YAML files. Here's the one for DB service. There's one for the pod. And then I have one for the um, web. And then I have a web service. So all four of those pillars are here in the YAML files. So the images are all ready to go at this point. So let's now um, go and take a look at the deploy folder, look at the files here, and let's go open up the pod definition. Just make sure I'm in the right spot. OK. 
Okay, having a little slight technical difficulty, but we'll get over this. So let's take a look at webpod1.yaml. And like I said, what is in this pod? Two containers, one for Redis and one for our web app that we just built. So how do we tell the system that we want to use those two um, images? Well, you do it here. Um, you can see that this is a pod right away. But you'll also notice here there's a list of containers, the first of which is Redis. That's for free. I get that for free because it's part of hub.docker.com. But the second image you can see here is the one I just built, the custom one. So when I run this file, so to speak, when I provision using it, it's going to bring up one pod with two containers. One of, the, one of them is the one I built, and the other one is Redis. Pod is a way to group things together. Don't you want your web app to be on the same VM bundled together with the um, caching layer. You want the cache and the web app together. And that's why they form a pod. So let's go ahead and quit out of here and actually do the kubectl command. Now this command is part of Kubernetes. It's a client utility you install that talks to our cluster. It's our way of communicating with the cluster. And in my video, I show you how to install that and configure it. It's pretty straightforward. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, create that pod. And it looks like it's now up and running. Let's take a look by issuing the command kubectl get pods. Sure enough, there it is. And I can just keep coming back to this thing and look at it again. OK, great. So now we've gotten one piece done, this one right here, the container. Um, we've got, still got to do three more things. Re uh, well, actually, this whole pod is done now. We need to do the service for this pod and then work on the database side. So let's do that next. <coughs> let's look at the service YAML file. And that's really simple. It's basically saying, OK, listen in on port 80 for someone making a, talking to my web app. But remember, the Flask app listens on port 5,000. So route that request to port 5,000 of, of the running container. And basically, this is it. We're exposing um, and routing traffic with this service. So now I need to do another kubectl command for this web service. And it's just, again, like you saw before, kubectl and pass in that YAML file. And now we can verify that the service is there with the simple command of kubectl get svc, or get service. So that's the next command we're going to issue here is kubectl get service. So we, we have now done the following. We have this um, entire agent one configured. We only need to now worry about the database. Now notice there's no external IP address yet. We're going to have to worry about that later to expose this service to the outside world. So let's now turn our attention to the database layer and get that going. So we'll take a look at the um, service for the database. Your question might be, Bruno, don't you have to have the pod before the service? The answer is no. You can do them. They're kind of idempotent. So again, I'm exposing uh, port 3306 in the service, and it's going to route to port 3306 in the running container. Now, this is not going to be exposed to the outside world. This is only going to be referenced from within the um, Flask application. So now let's go ahead and deploy this service. So I'm going to say um, kubectl, once again, the third of four times, passing in this YAML file. And I can go ask it again, hey, is my service running? Do you remember how? kubectl get svc. See, we're already reviewing this work. OK, so now we have both of them. We have the uh, MySQL service and the web service. OK, so the next step over here is um, the, da the database pod. We haven't done the last of the four, which is the database pod. Very simple. Just go get the latest MySQL image and run it as a container. Where, where's it getting MySQL again? Do you remember? Uh, Docker.com, just sitting there waiting for us to use. 
That's really one of the brilliant breakthroughs. Besides the image file format that Docker did, they created this repository where everyone in the world can put their images. So practically any workload you can think of is available as a running image. That's the breakthrough, I think, that made put Docker on the map. So let's now run that pod. And once I do that, I guess we can assume that all the pieces are up there now, right? So now I can say, show me. Let's verify that now um, two pods are running, one for the web and Redis, and then one for, OK, so there's a slight correction here I'm going to tell you. So it's created the pod. The next step, this command here, is to expose the web service and get an external IP address. And there, there's a number of ways to do this, but I'm going to do it just a quick and easy way. It's not scripted, really. Instead of saying node port here, I'm going to say load balancer. And then when I go ahead and um, say get SVC, I have an alias. So let me just spell it out so I don't take any shortcuts in front of you. I always add that R. Notice it says pending now. What is actually pending? It's trying to retrieve and create a load balancer, basically to get an IP address for my web service. So this will take a couple minutes. While it does that, I said, well, I don't want to sit here and, and, and be idle. Let's maybe talk about a few things. We know what a container is. A little history, maybe. Some people think the world of containers just happened. It actually started in 1979 with chroot, which is a way to isolate file systems for specific um, groups of users or a single user. So you'd have a segregated vision of the file system for a user. And so fast forward. Um, um, Sun Microsystems contributed quite a bit with Solaris and Jails. This was some really pioneering work in the world of containers. Uh, and it wasn't until 2008, I mean, there's a big gap there. You know, I think in, in the 80s, people were too busy disco dancing or whatever. There doesn't seem to be a lot happening there. But if you notice here in 2008, LXC was the first real way people were separating applications, both in terms of memory, disk, processor and applying controls so that a given container couldn't hog all of the system. That's really kind of the underpinnings of today's Docker containers is LXC. And it's still alive and well today. So Docker did not invent this. They added a standard file format and hub.docker.com. That was their breakthrough. And so fast forward all the way to today and now uh, imagine that there's even Windows containers just coming into existence. I'm working with McDonald's, and they're even looking at um, Windows containers to go in all the 35,000 McDonald's stores. Why? For easy and fast deployment. That's the big benefit here. OK, so one more slide here. Now, I talked to you about containers. What about orchestrators? What's the history there? It's a very young um, product. I mean, really, uh, the orchestrators really didn't start happening until 2008. And you know, a lot of the vendors here um, have uh, products. Amazon has a proprietary version, not open source. It's all API based. But really, the big ones that are popular are these three here the Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and um, DCOS. Now, there's some white papers, if I had more time, I could show you that came out of Google that inspired that. You know, Databricks, the creators of Spark, and so on. Um, Benjamin Heinemann, the founder of Mesosphere, all kind of working out of Berkeley at the same time, uh, created this stuff. But this predated kind of uh, containers in a way that were popular today. So Kubernetes is, I think, the most modern, born in the cloud version. So anyway, some history there. Let's go back to our app and see if we have uh, our IP address. We do, 52.176. So now I can go talk to my web app using that IP address. So there's some files over here. Um, I'm going to run this one Python script, which is going to insert that address into my shell scripts. So I, w I kind of tried to automate this so I wouldn't have to edit files in front of you. 
Okay, this one is just going to verify the service. We know that. Let's now go, go run my Python uh, script, which substitutes that IP address um, into my shell scripts. So if we look at, for example, init.sh, we're getting near the end, bear with me. There's that IP address. And what is it doing? It's calling that init in the Python script. Do you remember what init does? Creates the database, exactly right. So let's run this init now and watch the outcome. So I'm going to say bash init. Let me uh, clear the screen for you. Bash init.sh. I'm actually typing for real now. That's done. There's also an add shell script, which is very simple. And it's simply doing a post with curl. And notice what it's inserting. It's inserting a course number. This is ultimately going to go to the database, right? But we're calling that app.python script file, the Flask app, and doing the insert, right? And it's simply going to grab, you know, the Kubernetes, course 401, Kubernetes, an orchestrator, and then a record 2 and a record 3. Notice the record numbers, 403, 402, 401. Notice the IP address has been substituted in there. You could probably use a domain name to avoid this kind of headache. There's different ways to automate this. Let's go ahead now and run this script. And it's simply going to go in and add those three records. That is if it works. Okay, that's encouraging. I love 200s. Okay, record two. And we're posting the third record, record three. Now I can go and query this which calls the third kind of component in that Flask app, if I could spell query. And it's simply going to say, go and get record one, record two, and record three. Right? So this is the query. Remember, the query said forward slash courses, forward slash ID. So this is doing a query in my Python script. And now the, the if if everything is, has a happy ending today, I'll be able to actually um, see the data come back, meaning the whole thing uh, works. So, oh, we got record one. That's encouraging. How about record two? You can do it. Record two. And finally, record three. Pretty confident that'll come up. Excellent. So that showed you kind of soup to nuts how we would um, provision a cluster, well the cluster was provisioned, how we would deploy into a cluster, how we would configure and build our own custom container, how to spin up pods, how to spin up services, how to expose public IP addresses, how to go in and use ordinary kind of API commands to talk to that RESTful service in Python and insert and retrieve data. So thankfully it worked. I didn't embarrass myself. Pretty happy about that. How much time do we have? Got a few more minutes. So again, oh, one thing I did want to show, actually, before I conclude that, I wanted to show you the uh, couple, I have a couple minutes, so why not, right? So some people ask, you know, well, what's the difference? Why do I need containers beyond just easy deployment and fast scaling? Well, take up, take up the old world, where you have lots of VMs running your apps, right? The problem has been this, that um, there's a dependency on these DLLs, the, uh, the, the parts that my app might want to talk to. Now imagine that I have lots of apps talking to my DLLs. Imagine that I update one of the DLLs. What is potentially the outcome of that? One of the apps talking to those DLLs might break. In the world of containerization, each app comes with its own DLLs. So I don't have to worry about breaking my app by updating its dependency is the bottom line. And I think this is one of the main contributors to its predictability. Hey, it worked on my laptop. How come it's not working in production? Well, because production might have had different dependencies there compared to your laptop. But with containerization, it doesn't matter. Those dependencies ship with your application. That's the magic of all this. Also notice that I have less virtual machines, fewer virtual machines, and I could have more virtualization happening because they're sharing an operating system. The kernel is being shared by these two containers. In the world of VMs, you need to have two VMs for two apps. The 
you don't want to have conflicts and dependencies. So that's kind of like the high level picture of what makes containers uh, special. Um, and I think you saw this command here, right? We did Docker uh, build. We had our Docker file, which you saw. That was the Python script. We did a Docker build command, and we came up with an image. Then we uploaded that image with a Docker push. But later, you didn't see this, because Kubernetes hid this from you. We didn't need to do a Docker run command. The orchestrator did all this. But in, at the command line, if we didn't have Kubernetes, if we were running just kind of Docker plain vanilla, you would have to run the image yourself. But we didn't have to do that again because Kubernetes was able to do that. So this first link is a walkthrough of all the steps I showed you written down on GitHub. This is the YouTube video. So if you want to go watch uh, my presentation again, which I'm sure could have been more clear, this will walk you through. It's a 23-minute demo. And it's everything I just showed you command-wise. So you ought to be able to, my guidance for anyone wanting to learn Kubernetes is to just do it. Go walk through it. It'll give you a solid understanding. OK, excellent. So um, that's what I want to talk about. Do we have any questions or comments, suggestions, threats? <laughs> Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm counting on your um, secrecy. Uh, you've all sworn to secrecy, right? <laughs> what is it uh, we heard our president say? Um, I am counting on your loyalty. <laughs> okay. The, the second, uh, I have two more questions. The second is, what, uh, what keyboard are you using? Is it a mechanical keyboard? I wrote a C program. It's called the Keyboard Hook, which essentially listens in. It runs kind of like a daemon in Linux and listens on my keyboard. So it's just a custom utility I wrote a few years ago that uh, basically I've pre-recorded. I'd happy to show you the utility. It's a little bit involved, but it's, it's helpful. <laughs> Thank you for asking about that. Uh, I'll show it to you on my, on my computer here uh, real quickly in case you're curious. It's this guy right here. It runs as kind of like a daemon in the Windows environment. I still want to build one for Mac OS. I have a Mac, but I, haven't, I don't use it for demos for that reason. So, I, you know, you're a curious group. We have a couple minutes, so I can go back to my F drive code, PM insert. So this is a Visual Studio project that has that application, in case you were curious. If you're really curious, here's the, uh, the answer. So there's a bunch of projects here that do it. The one um, that we're interested in here is uh, Win32. It's kind of a brutal program to look at. There's a slight discrepancy here in Visual Studio. So what I'm going to do is PS kill dev environment. I have a utility for this particular bug that I'm getting. So I'm going to say um, fix Visual Studio. <laughs> you can tell I've been here before. It simply removes this caching folder, which I think gets corrupted somehow. OK, we're back. And this time, it, there should be no errors. It should just work. OK, so there's a ton of scripts here. Let me go to the C program in particular. Here it is. Here's the keyboard hook. So it's just a C program um, that records all the keystrokes, separate one from the numeric keypad. You know, and essentially, what it does, at the end of the day, it calls, um, it does an exec and calls another program. Let me see if I can find that code. Yeah, it's kind of not fun to look at. But the bottom line is here, if we look at the real program that does the work, it's this one here. It's a Visual Studio project. I'm digressing ma majorly here, too much perhaps. But here's all the numbers. So essentially, when I type in 600 or 476, it's going to run that app. So I can run videos like 476. Watch this. I'll just go print screen 476. There's my video. Whoa. Emails. You don't need to see that. 
But it does videos, it goes to websites, it does different stuff. Put stuff in the clipboard. That's just my little, little geek stuff when I'm on a plane, kind of play around. But how about a Kubernetes question? That was a great question. <laughs> Any other questions of orchestrators? Yes, sir. Hello, good morning. Um, it's more like a suggestion. Um, I think it would be nice to, to see uh, if you launch two pods and that each pod would uh, identify itself when you do a request. And you, for example, kill one so that uh, we can see the resilience of Kubernetes. On yes, on so the question was, it would be, because if you think about an orchestrator, what does an orchestrator really do? It scales up and down, potentially based on performance indicators, right? It will relaunch a failed service, and you can create um, probes that check the health of your pod. And if it's down, reschedule another pod to run on the cluster to replace it. And the question is, it'd be cool if your demo can illustrate that. And I agree. It was more of a time constraint in my case. But it would be cool to see the thing heal itself. That's one of the promises of orchestration, right, that if something breaks, the system's smart enough to fix itself. That's one of the things an orchestrator does. So that's a great point, and I will take it under advisement to do that. Good questions, keep them coming. Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the Microsoft containers, um, how they are different or not. From the Windows containers? The Windows containers, sorry. Yeah, so we've been working closely with Docker. I have passwords in that, too. I've got to be careful what I'm showing. Um, so we're in a partnership with, uh, with Docker um, to build out the, the Windows containers. And as you can imagine, Windows has evolved over three decades or more. And so there's a lot of, how shall we say, baggage in there from old versions. And so it's been a challenge. For example, there's a fax service running under Windows that is in the full Windows uh, version. And so we've been, over the years, trying to streamline Windows, that we have this one kernel that works in mobile, that works on Windows 2000 server, that runs without a GUI. And so the work has been to trim down, put Windows on a massive diet, slim it down so that it can spin up quickly. And also to refactor the kernel to be uh, more resilient and more capable in, in a clustered environment. The networking stack it turns out, is the hardest thing to replicate. So the engineering teams at Microsoft have worked especially hard to have the networking stack work, play well with, with the Docker uh, orchestrator. So, but the concept is identical. And I have some blog posts that show you how to build a Windows container to run an ASP.NET web app. And I expect there'll be a ton of corporations that are going to just take their giant monolithic app and just put it in a container because they want that ease of deployment. They want that DevOps, that workflow. And uh, so that's pretty much, you know, Docker, for example, has commissioned uh, a company to go out there with $500 million and help companies migrate to a containerized world. And the question becomes, do you want to really put a monolithic app in a container? What's the advantage? The advantage is deployment and dependency management. And over time, you decompose it into separate containers slowly and carefully. If any of you are fans of Martin Fowler, anyone know Martin Fowler? You know, the godfather of kind of patterns and design. He has this whole theory about start with a monolithic app and over a long period of time decompose it. And you know, this whole microservice architecture, there's pros and cons and lots of debate about how to do that. Like Martin Fowler makes the point, first write the monolithic app, then you'll know how it really works, then you can decompose it. So it's, it's a great question about what's, where's the world going with Windows containers? And it's yet to be seen how that all plays out, actually. Excellent question. So we have time for another question. One more. Just one more. You can ask me questions about the US. <laughs> no, no, no. no don't, don't do that. that. <laughs> I have questions, too. Okay, awesome. Brilliant. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you.